And we are back with Block Digest, episode 241, at block height 654,142, Saturday, October 24th. So what is up, Janine? Season premiere. An end to vacation. What's vacation? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I don't know, doing all the same things except not taking an hour or two to record talking about it. <laughs> yep, basically. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there is a lot, of, a lot of doozies that happened over the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. But I guess a quick mention of a, a nice thing that happened is Taproot was finally merged into Bitcoin Core. Maybe, maybe you know, halfway to the next happening, we'll finally have an activation mechanism figured out. Yeah, so what even is, I haven't checked the conversation around that because it sounds like at least the validation script stuff is going to be included in the December release of Bitcoin Core, or December-ish. Um, but I, obviously that's not when it gets activated, but what, is, is there any kind of timeline for that yet? No, I think everybody is still um, reticent to pick BIP8 or BIP9 or one or the other, and all the fancy hybrids between them are just, it's, it's like, I, I think, honestly, we, we might just see a fork happen that people start running with a flag day at this point, because it, it's just getting kind of silly. Like, pick one, put both in a single thing, like, let's... Let's do something here. User activated soft fork. Well, I mean, it's... tap that. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it'd be way different than last time because there isn't really contention, so to say, just reticence. But I mean, yeah. Or maybe another reckless campaign. I mean, we'll we'll see. But it's it's just it's kind of getting silly at this point, even being somebody who wants to go slow and steady and be patient like e even i'm starting to kind of be like come on guys like when, when are we going to do this meanwhile the normies have no idea what we're talking about even even some of the cryptographers have no idea what we're talking about well we're not quite to the mainstream yet but i don't know what is the mainstream doing well uh one of the things that happened on hiatus was the uh, IMF announcing um, a new Bretton Woods moment. And woo, um, not going to spend a lot of time going through uh, point by point um, the entire announcement. Uh, but pretty much it's global debt to GDP has exploded this year because everybody torpedoed their economy. Um, and that's going to disproportionately start screwing the developing world and, and just destroy, um, you know, or already has uh, the national economies all over the place. 
And so they're, they're, they're talking the new Bretton Woods um, moment to radically shift uh, economic policy everywhere. And it's, it's pretty much a lot of like, you know, just obviously the money printer goes on and, and we're going to pay for health care for everybody and education because yada yada and deal with gender inequality issues. And it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much just a socialist package um, that's like, let, let's just go full um, socialism and use the COVID lockdowns and the economy getting wrecked a, as a, a rationale for that. And there's been a lot of discussion, too, besides that, um, specifically just around central bank um, digital currencies. And really, I, I think that the, the whole issue is not really being looked at rationally. You know, I, I don't think I have to spell out the dynamics as far as if a central bank did that, how that would torpedo the private banking sector. Um, so that's a huge trade-off. But just like what what does CBDC even mean? Like if you just get an account with the Fed, that's essentially what that would be. And they can still track all your things. Um, they can still censor your payments. Um, you know, what does that even mean? How is that in any way different than the banking system nowadays, except there's no longer a private bank in between you and the Fed. Like that fundamentally in all the, the material ways that matter is no different than how things work now. And I think the only way that anything could be fundamentally different would be, let's say the United States does that and wants to push that money into Africa, like get Africa using the, the USD CBDC token um, and pretty much be able to directly export our economic policy like that. But the thing is, why would a bunch of people in Africa um, trust that they're not just going to have their money arbitrarily frozen every other day? Um, if the system can do that. And so in order to really build any kind of trust where something like that would happen, you would have to design the system so that you can't just arbitrarily censor things or surveil people. Because otherwise, why am I half a continent away going to trust your foreign CBDC over other alternatives that I have? And so really like the, just this whole like freak out lately of the CBDCs are coming. Um, I think it's just a giant meme and nobody's really thinking through like what changes if that happens. Because I don't see the United States doing anything like what I just mentioned anytime soon. <laughs> They're not just going to make a totally uncensorable system as a trade off to be able to export economic policy like that. And I really don't think many countries in the world would do that. Like China, Iran, Venezuela, countries like that. But most countries in the world, I just don't think they would do that. And so aside from a situation like that, I really think this, this whole CBDC stuff is, it's a irrelevant meme. Like the, the relevant issue here is what are they going to do with that economic policy, which is just start shifting towards a planned controlled economy and whether or not anywhere can get rid of cash because a CBDC, it's no different than your bank account. The problem is, well, if they take cash away. And so I, I just think like a lot of the discussion around these topics in the past two weeks, like people haven't stepped back and really asked deep questions like that. It's just the CBDCs are coming. Yeah, and there's a uh, relevant paper on this uh, topic in general that I haven't finished yet, but it looks quite interesting. It's titled Civil Liberties in Times of Crisis. Um, and it basically, they just 
um, did surveys in 15 countries, over 370,000 people, and looked at the extent to which people are willing to trade away their civil liberties during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's fun. I would recommend reading that to see how uh, how uh, weak-handed your neighbors are. Yeah. But, like, you know what I mean, though? It's like this... The CBDC, it doesn't matter. It's what are they doing with policy and could they actually pull off taking cash away? Because if cash still sticks around and you have a CBDC wallet instead of a bank account right now, like how, what changed? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just it, it's something I think like people need to ask a lot more deep questions about and like rather than just meme like there is a wave of cbdc's coming that are going to materially change things most won't if they happen like start asking who would actually create something that they could export to somewhere like africa because people will trust it because it is actually impossible to censor like who actually would do that and why uh well one of the papers that i covered in my upcoming newsletter was actually a thing from the european central bank about cbdc's and yeah the impression i got was that they're looking at it but they really don't know yet they were they were actually almost saying that they wanted to design it as close to cash as possible without anonymity of course but otherwise close to cash which i i highly doubt that that's going to be the case mm -hmm. but it's like you know like in order for a cbdc to really be made that mattered in any material sense you you have to be a state that one doesn't care if you implode your financial sector and in developed world countries like the the us or a lot of europe like that can be upwards of 50% of your economy. And then two, um, you have to be okay with um, probably being very totalitarian in order to deal with the consequences of doing something like imploding half of your economy. And it's like it, all these papers from places like the, the ECB, the, the Bank of England, like you read them and you can tell they understand this dynamic. Like they, they don't think they can just flip a switch like that and there aren't massive consequences to weigh the trade-offs for. So like they, they get all the actual reasons why they should be extremely cautious in walking down that road. And I think it's, it's like that's just a natural choke point to they're going to make something that doesn't really matter. Yeah, and also, I mean, there's going to be a lot of differences between countries in Europe in terms of whether they would accept something like that. Like Germany, for example, I mean, Germany is a very bureaucratic country, so they might, you know, as a as the state might be on board with it, but um, adoption and use of cash is still very, very high in Germany. So I don't see people being willing to switch to something like that at least not not within like 10 years yeah i remember last time i was over there it was extremely weird seeing how common it was for shops to just not have the ability to process a card payment like that that was kind of weird yep there's uh there's even ones that like advertise on you know those popular sites where you advertise businesses like Yelp and stuff and a lot of them in Germany if you check them out they'll say that they don't accept card they actually have a label for that a lot of the time yeah so it's it's pretty much in places like that good luck because uh yeah I I don't see cash getting killed very easily or quickly in a lot of places and taking cash away is really the the thing that makes how most of these coins are probably going to play out matter in any way to people's lives. Alrighty, though. I uh, guess you want to take us through the uh, the next one? The uh, 
American centric fork of all this travel rule stuff that looks like it's uh pretty much trying to take over the scene. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I, I actually tweeted about this paper after I finished reading it because when I got to the end of, I think it was 33 pages long, I was just like, seriously, why did it take them 33 pages to say that they wanted or they thought that the best way to transmit sensitive information to each other, which by the way, they consider each other to be untrusted third parties, which is hilarious because it's like trusted third parties are security holes to trusted third parties. Um, but by the end of it, they basically said, oh, well, the best way to transmit sensitive information uh, is with encrypted private peer-to-peer -peer networks that have minimal data retention policies. That was basically what they were saying. And it took them 33 pages to say this. And I was just like, seriously? So you're telling me that, um, you know, because all of this is about complying with the um, fat F. I'm going to call them the fat F. The big fat F. Um, all of this is about complying with the big fat F. And, you know, the big fat F is one of these agencies that is in other places saying that, you know, using encrypted communications, using peer to peer networks, these are like markers of potential criminality. And so you're telling me that you're going to design a network between all of you companies to communicate securely with encryption in a peer-to-peer -peer network with minimal data retention policy. That's very interesting. Anyway, so uh, back in the July issue of This Month in Bitcoin Privacy, I had highlighted that a working group of U.S.-based virtual asset service providers, or VASPs, uh, I'm very tempted to call them WASPs because they are annoying, uh, was recently formed to design, uh, quote, a collective solution for complying with financial the Financial Action Task Force rules on sharing customer data. That's the big fed F. Um, during the Global Digital Finance Travel Rule Summit, sounds like a fun time in July, uh, Coinbase Chief Compliance Officer Jeff Horowitz had said that a white paper for an inter-VASP bulletin board system was on the way. Uh, and then... Basically, the U.S. Travel Rule Working Group, or USTRWG, a coalition of 25-plus U.S. VASPs, has published an announcement um, as of October 20th. And, of course, for anyone who doesn't know, the travel rule, as they define it, uh, and they say it was designed to help law enforcement agencies detect, investigate, and prosecute money laundering and other financial crimes by manipulating an information by, oh, manipulating, haha, <laughs> maintaining an information trail of transaction originators and beneficiaries. Um, and so just to clarify, uh, you know, there, I mean, there's a few rules about like what, what is considered a travel rule, uh, uh, relevant payment, but the basic standard is, uh, over $3,000 or I guess 3,000 euros, maybe I don't where 3,000 is the magic number, but then, I don't know, I, get, I saw today that there's like some AML compliance group that's now saying it should be $250 or more, and I'm just like, or, well, not just me, everyone else is like, screw yeah, you. Yeah, anyway, at the moment it's 3,000, so let's just stick with something that's um, not quite as insane. Um but what I found interesting is that from the original list of at least six companies that people had kind of compiled um, back when this white paper was still pending, uh, the companies were Coinbase, Bittrex, Gemini, Kraken, BitGo, and Shapeshift, um, who were kind of in different ways uh, indicating or maybe not indicating, but just being suspected of becoming members of this working group. Uh, only half of them have actually appeared in the members directory for this working group so far. I believe it was Coinbase, Coinbase, Kraken, and Shapeshift. Um, Bittrex, Gemini, and BitGo are not on that list yet. I don't know if that's because they haven't applied or they decided not to, but for some reason they're not on the list, even though Bittrex actually stated that they were going to be a member. Um, other notable parties who have appeared in the members directory are Consensus, Hardware Wallet Developer Ledger, <laughs> Of course, the blockchain surveillance companies CypherTrace and Elliptic, and Zcash's Electric Coin Company. Now, of course, the last one should not be a shock to anyone because they already belong to a law enforcement friendly forum called the Blockchain Alliance, and Zuko is Zuko. 
Um, and so they say in the white paper that the solution, this bulletin board and peer-to-peer network KYC information sharing thing will incorporate both governance and technology layers that will allow users of the solution network participants to identify counterparty VASPs and securely connect with one another in order to share travel rule data. Uh, the white paper states that initially the ad, the address VASP lookup mechanism um, that is like finding out which addresses belong to which VASP um, will support only Bitcoin and Ether and that data transmission will be conducted in a point-to-point manner, uh, thereby limiting the receipt of customer data to the VASP who owns the receiving address. And while they do not provide even a rough timeline or any kind of deadlines whatsoever in this paper, which makes it a bit like useless in terms of that, um, for when the different phases of this platform solution is supposed to come into effect, the uh, second and final phase involves, quote, expanding the solution beyond the U.S. to enable the sharing of travel rule data with qualified VASPs globally. Uh, they clarify that this would not involve the uh, what they term to be unhosted wallets, which they define in the beginning of the paper as non-custodial wallets or private wallets, which, um, well, you know, makes the uh, the some of the memberships in this uh, working group to be a bit curious, like uh, Ledger and Zcash, you know, what are you guys doing there? In non-custodial private wallets, anyone? Yep. Really, I question any company that's proactively involved in this shit. Yeah, and then the uh, uh, they also say the solution does not cover the cases where an unhosted wallet is involved in a transaction as either the sender or receiver under FinCEN and um, Big Fat F guidance. FAFs are not required to send travel rule data to unhosted wallets as unhosted wallets are not considered to be money transmitters or FAFs. FASPs. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm so tempted to just say wasps. Um, Insofar as the transactions conducted through unhosted wallets uh, are to purchase goods or services on the user's own behalf. Um, And then also, despite uh, the fact that there are two blockchain surveillance companies in this working group, they also note in the paper that such tools are insufficient um, for the task of identifying addresses even owned by other VASPs, let alone individual entities. They say, uh, while blockchain analytics tools offer some insight into potential ownership, they do not completely solve the lookup challenge of accurately identifying all transaction county parties for travel rule compliance purposes. Hmm, that's very interesting. Yeah. So you're saying that their software is not accurate. Hmm. Um, relevant. <laughs> that was so funny to see in there. Yeah, very, very relevant. Um, I guess uh, I don't know what uh, Cypher Trace and Elliptic had to say about this, but this does not look good for you people, you know? Um, not being accurate. Uh, they also uh, <laughs> they also explicitly acknowledge that, uh, like I said, trusted third parties are security holes to other trusted third parties, where they say, as the network grows and membership increases, trust will decrease and technological controls and systems must be installed to prevent bad actors from attempting to compromise sensitive travel rule information. Uh, strong encryption standards and data transfer protocols are required to ensure that customer data is not compromised or leaked when it is collected, transmitted, or stored. Um, yeah, so I find it funny that they're, you know, they're kind of scratching their heads and like, how do we solve this trust problem? What do we do about the trust? It's on the tip of my tongue. Hmm. Yes. Uh, also, what's that you say? Strong encryption, secure communication, a peer-to-peer private network? Minimal data retention. Um, as I said at the start of this, uh, I'm sorry, but I thought those things were only being used by criminals. So uh, whatever you guys do, make sure to enable your JavaScript and don't forget to give the government their golden key. Yep. Personally, I think the funniest part of this entire thing is just them finally realizing like the massive complexity involved in all of this. <clears throat> like how... Um, the the first phase they're just going to support bitcoin and ethereum given that that's like 90 percent of the uh wasp to wasp <laughs> um, exchange volume but um yeah and like think about how many other things there are out there how many different like transaction types consensus rules stupid dumb shit 
like they they even mention um advanced ethereum smart contracts are out of scope um for the first phase so they're they're just doing vanilla ethereum addresses and then when they start talking about the um address verification mechanism like how how you would actually prove to another vasp um that this is you know my address and i am also a vasp they they get into the issues of say multi-sig and well how do you interpret and label a multi-sig and like who's in control of that is it a single entity is that maybe a vasp and a customer directly on chain or what what about any businesses that pretty much send deposits directly to cold storage how do you prove that address um that's supposed to be air gapped because it's cold storage and it's like those are just the issues on bitcoin like what what about all these fancy wackadoodle ethereum smart contracts what about all these other chains with wild complex goofy ass architecture like <laughs> you guys are gonna have to figure out how to port the the vanilla bitcoin eth version of this system to all of that insanity <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know if you looked through the um i don't know what exactly to call it it's not quite a demo but it's like samples of what i think is supposed to be code towards the end of the paper and i didn't look at it too closely but i was very unimpressed that it was basically just some commands in like a terminal or something i think maybe it was a text document uh but it was like very plain and boring i was like wow what have you guys been doing all this time you had like all of these companies together have tons of money and the the membership directory directory actually notes which ones are patrons which i assume means people who are like paying or giving money to this working group to function so I'm just wondering, like, what the hell all these people have been doing? <laughs> Why it took them so long to write, you know, like I said on, oh, on Twitter. It's not even code. That's literally just, like, <clears throat> a pseudo-generic example for the arrays they store data with. It's, it's, it's not even code. Great. Yeah, and like like you were saying, they like because people like to say, "Oh, Bitcoin development moves slow," but I think we've just found something that's probably going to move even slower than Bitcoin because they're not like they're. Can you imagine them trying to like address Schnorr or Taproot or any of that shit? That's going to take them like decades to get there at this pace. Um, but I also do find it funny, given that you know, not only do they say we're not interested in non-custodial wallets, really, we're not interested in private private wallets um they do say they want to eventually get to privacy coins but like like we said they're only going after bitcoin and ether so why the fuck is zcash jumping jumping the gun and getting involved with this thing like what are you guys doing there huh like you're you're not relevant yet you can you can hold your horses uh, a bit or hold your fluffy ponies i guess uh fluffy pony does not <laughs> I don't see Fluffy Pony signing up to this. So, like, what what are you people doing jumping on board with this when Zcash is not even being looked at? Like, what what is wrong with you people? Yeah. It's it's almost like they're so desperate to like not get the stink eye of the government that every opportunity they get, they're just joining all of the law enforcement friendly forums. Like, "Hey, we're here. Please don't kill us." Yep. And you know, I'm I'm just thinking about this now. I can see some very conflicted maximalists out there in the future who don't really care too much about privacy stuff cuz just thinking about trying to expand this protocol to all of the stupid crazy shit coins out there. Um what if the compliance costs for that wind up being why um, casino exchanges just start dropping the piles of shit coins? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how I'd feel about that if it played out like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I find it funny. Like, they're not even at the stage of that, having that many members and... You know, a, a bunch, some of these companies I didn't recognize, but a lot of them have been around for a long time, at least the ones that seem to be 
mainly running this thing. Like Coinbase was the author of the announcement of the white paper, for example, apparently. And it's like, there's not even that many of them yet, but they're already saying like, hey, we don't trust each other. How do we fix that? <laughs> yep. It's like, good question. I wonder who, who tried to make a system that addressed that problem by not relying on trust. Mm -hmm. Get the trust out of your money. I think it'll be a while before that clicks for them. Also, like, in just in general terms, like, this, it was such a shitty white paper, like, there was barely any citations. Like, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why it took them 33 pages to come to the conclusion, like, oh, we should encrypt our shit, we should use a peer, you should use peer-to-peer -peer transfers, but, like, where is your citations? There's, like, almost no citations in the paper. Like, I, d I, I, I don't know how many people were directly working on this, but I'm just so, like, I feel like I myself have written longer, more cited stuff than all of these people put together. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, they're, they're being clowns. But anyway. I think, yep, next is a, a big release for an alternative to the clowns. Yeah, speaking of non-custodial uh, private wallets, um, there has been a new BISC release. Uh, on October 21st, they released version 1.4.2, which in addition to supporting SegWit addresses, yay, they will, uh, or they have updated the Tor v2 seed nodes with Tor v3 seed nodes. Um, they do note, uh, just to be clear, that um, the SegWit addresses are for transferring in and out of the BISC wallet, but uh, they say that the trading aspect still uses P2 PKH addresses, so that has not been fixed yet. I think they say it will come in the next release or so, um, so just be aware of that. But yay, you can uh, fill your BISC wallet using SegWit addresses. And uh, why is the Tor thing important? Uh, that's because in July of this year, the Tor project announced their deprecation uh, timeline for the Tor v2 hidden service addresses with uh, warnings to come for Onion service operators and clients. Actually, that started in September, so that's already been happening if you do any of that stuff. And then there will be a final deadline of, I think it was July 2021, um, just to summarize, their post said to uh, summarize why we are deprecating in one word safety. Onion Service V2 uses RSA uh, 1024 and 80-bit SHA-1 truncated addresses. This uh, also still uses the TA, I don't, the TAP handshake. I'm not familiar with uh, how to pronounce it other than TAP, uh, which has been entirely removed from Tor for many years now except for V2 services. Its simplistic directory system exposes it to a variety of enumeration and location prediction attacks that give HS uh, directory relays uh, too much power and enumerate or even block V2 services. Finally, V2 services are not being developed or maintained anymore. Only the most severe security issues are being addressed. So that is why um, they're Oh, there's a lot of stuff in Bitcoin right now that is being upgraded to Tor v3, so that makes sense. Mm hmm Honestly, like, this... <sighs> More people need to use BISC. Yeah, funnily enough, um, I mean, I uh, can't actually remember. Are we going to talk about... Are we going to talk... We're, we're not going to talk about HODL HODL lending, are we? I can't remember if it's on the news desk. Uh, no, it's not on the desk, but you can okay. get into it. Well, to mention it quickly, because it's kind of related to BISC, um, but yeah, hot, been a lot of talk about HODL HODL uh, opening their new lending service. And one thing that kind of irked me is that on the website, they have you know a page that says where you can buy stable coins because uh, you need to use stable coins for the platform. And all of the exchanges they list are... Um, not uh, the no KYC peer-to-peer -peer kind of thing that they're trying to be. And so I was like, well, wait a second. If you need stable coins, how do you get them privately um, if, you know, that's your goal for using this lending platform for privacy? 
And so I actually checked which stable coins were available on BISC. And it looks like they support, um, I think it was USDC, which is, which is the Coinbase stable coin. They also support DAI. Um, and, but when I checked, uh, there was like almost, there was like no transfers in the history for uh, uh, USDC. There was some for DAI, but like the the market in BISC is not big for those. But you know, if you wanted to start one, I guess you can use BISC to get them if you want to be uh, totally privacy preserving. But yeah, um, that's going to be a problem: is how do people actually get the stable coins <laughs> uh, and maintain their privacy before they can start using the lending platform? Yeah, I don't really see why there would be big demand for stable coins on. BISC, like the entire thing is around just not having or distributing like the bank transfer or money or however you want to do that so that there isn't like the single fingerprint or obviousness with that flow. So like it, <laughs> the whole architecture is around fixing the fiat side. So why, why would BISC users want to use a stable coin? Well, just if they, you know, want to do this lending platform and not have to dox themselves to Coinbase first or something in order to do private peer-to-peer lending. Mm-hmm. But it's like, uh, B- BISC is such an underused, like, tool in this space. And it's like, that that thing really needs to exist and have more, at least, visibility like people actually know it's there and really start working on like long-term engineering. You know what I mean? Like imagine BISC where just do everything in a DLC. Um, you know, if they supported lightning um, and if people like Nadav from shared bits uh, figure out some of the, the routing issues with things like DLCs. Um, hey, we can do a swap over lightning. Like the, the, you know, think about the efficiency gains there in lifting like the the multi sig stuff off chain and not having to, you know, pay mining fees for shit like that. Like it, ah oh man. I don't know. I'm I'm just a little down right now with all of the uh, FATF shit and KYC exchanges and how that's not uh, not resulting in a massive explosion of disk users. Also should mention something that we didn't get onto the news desk because it literally just got published an hour ago, but Ruben Sompson um, published something about peer-to-peer lending with Liquid Bitcoin um, and USD Tether. So there's that too. Mm -hmm. I was probably going to bring that up uh, in the next episode once I get a chance to actually think things through, but it looks like... uh roughly kind of like a uh, open-ended um, atomic swap pretty much where you commit to an output that isn't funded with an input and then um, that's kind of a thing that can just be filled in and closed out at any point. I should mention though that I don't I philosophically don't agree with the term stable coins. I much prefer, I believe Bob McElrath referred to them as one second I need to get the term because it was good. He he referred to them, I think, in 2018. Um, I mean, most people ca- call them stable coins or crypto fiat, and but he called them collateralized inflationary shitcoin pegs. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Moving along. So, Blockstream has uh, rebranded their uh, Blockstream securities uh, platform. Uh to asset management platform and granularized and added uh, some new features. So for those who don't remember, um, this is their server API platform so that er, issued assets on liquid, like equities that have to be restricted to accredited investors and things like that can be kept in a two of two multi-sig Um, between the holder and the issuer so that they can refuse to process transactions, um, make sure that that is only going to a registered accredited investor, 
um, yada, yada, so on and so forth. Um, so they've built out um, kind of a split in terms of how things are working um, and added in the uh, green or what, what is it called? Hold on. The green um, address ID so that uh, you can effectively register a identity um, with the, the server for an asset issuer. Um, and that would be the basis of whether to approve or deny um, a transaction. So if it's a, a stock that can only be owned by this pool of people, um, the server would refuse to sign any transaction going to somebody not registered in that pool of people. And they've also, because of um, you know growing interest in doing stable coins on Liquid, um, kind of created a registration variant um, using that same ID system where transacting with something is not restricted, um, but they still have um, the necessary information and ID information to see who has balances in that registered user base, like who sent money to who, um, and kind of still gain an insight into like where are those stable coins going, even though it's not set up to outright freeze things. And um, yeah, I, I'm that I'm kind of really happy about because I, I've been kind of thinking stable coins are just going to get pushed into like they can only exist if they're completely censorable. Um, and it sucks you're not using the privacy side of liquid in, in a setup like that, but at least things couldn't be outright frozen if they were issued under that rather than the um, transaction restricted um, setup with this. But uh, yeah, L Liquid is just really starting to become a weird, interesting thing in the terms of like stuff like this being built out on it that is hyper uh, regulatory compliant. Like that's the design goal. But you still have an open access system that anybody can put Bitcoin into. Um, they can transact on it. Um, and there's that other side of, well, totally private things that you can't even find to censor if enough of the Federation agreed to are like coexisting next to things like this. It's, it's, it's a weird little sandbox environment don't think it's a weird sandbox mm, yes at this point i'm kind of just interested in like what what does liquid get used more for um weird it... little hacky things that shouldn't be getting done or the hyper compliant is it a weird sandbox because you know occasionally you find like rat turds and stuff it's that, just that kind of weird it's just weird because it's a federated environment with these tools to be like legally and regulatory or regulatorily compliant on top of it. But Those, it also that's the rat is, turds. <laughs> but it also is robust enough that like I could just go start doing stuff on it and pull some shenanigans and like haha, you can't stop me. Like ostensibly, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you can uh, build your sandcastle, and then a rat's going to come and shit in it. But he won't know it's my sandcastle. Maybe. Alrighty, though. Who else wants to shit in our castles? The DOJ, which I think is uh, going to be a, a pretty long segment starting now. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um. So, yeah... U.S. Attorney General William Bill Barr and his Cyber Digital Task Force. By the way, I uh, I loathe um, any I loathe the naming schemes of of the U.S. government or governments in general. They are so uncreative. 
how like seriously cyber digital are you kidding me anyway uh cyber digital task force which has apparently managed to exist since 2018 published a report on the department of justice's uh emerging cryptocurrency enforcement framework uh the press release for the report states the framework provides a comprehensive overview of the emerging threats and enforcement challenges associated with the increasing prevalence and use of cryptocurrency details uh, the important relationships that the Department of Justice has built with regulatory and enforcement partners, both within the United States government and around the world, and outlines the department's response strategies. And so similar to the Big Fat F report that I highlighted last month in my Bitcoin privacy newsletter, issue four, the uh, Associate Deputy Attorney General and Task Force Chair uh, Sujit Raman argues that decentralized platforms, peer-to-peer -peer exchangers, and anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies, which will henceforth be referred to as AECs, uh, that use non-public or private blockchains all can further obscure financial transactions um, and, uh, from legitimate scrutiny. And then later on, under the section Ongoing Challenges and Future Strategies, they warn that their acceptance may, the acceptance of AECs may undermine the AML uh, CFT, which is uh, Anti Money Laundering. Uh, what's that acronym again? Ter yeah, yeah, Counterterrorism Financing Controls used to detect suspicious activity by MSBs and other financial institutions may limit or even negate a business's ability to conduct AML uh, and counterterrorism financing checks on customer activity and to satisfy BSA requirements. That is a bit, hmm, because that basically suggests that if you're a money service business, like an exchange, and you use or accept or list these AECs, uh, they apparently have the intention to maybe argue that you should be stripped of that because you can't effectively satisfy BSA. So die, that's shit cool. coins, die! Yeah, so it says um, some anonymity-enhanced cryptocurrencies, however, offer features such as public view keys that potentially can facilitate the fulfillment of AML CFT obligations depending on the implementation of such features. We all know who they're talking about. It's a good little frenzy cash with their law enforcement friendly Zuko. That's who it is. Um, they don't get mentioned, but we all know that's who they're talking about. Um, under the threat overview, they note that these are often referred to as anonymity enhanced cryptocurrencies or privacy coins. Examples of AECs include Monero, Zcash, and Dash. Under legitimate uses, I have to scroll a bit, they include a generalized commentary from cryptocurrency advocates on the value of privacy. This shall be good. It says, uh, cryptocurrency advocates also stress that the privacy associated with cryptocurrency, though raising significant challenges for law enforcement, can have valid and beneficial uses. For example, such advocates claim that greater anonymity may reduce the risk of account or identity theft associated with the use of traditional credit systems. Like, yeah, duh. It's like, <laughs> you can't, you can't, uh, get your identity stolen if you, uh, don't use you aren't forced to use an identity with the system in the first place that's uh it's very smart to figure that out um then under justice department uh the response strategies they claim that some virtual currency exchanges have attempted to withhold that now this is first time i've heard this um some virtual currency exchanges have attempted to withhold data requested by law enforcement agencies including through criminal grand jury subpoenas by invoking the general data protection regulation or gdpr they believe that such objections uh the well the doj believes that such objections to lawful requests for information are illegitimate and then there's this quote about how um uh basically them explaining why the gdpr does not apply and it says GDPR does not, in fact, bar companies subject to the U.S. Jurisdic jurisdiction from complying with lawful requests in criminal investigations. To the contrary, GDPR explicitly permits the disclosure of data in a number of scenarios. For example, a virtual exchange that is subject to GDPR may process the requested data under GDPR Article 6.1 
when necessary for compliance with legal obligation, a legal obligation to which the controller is subject or necessary for the purpose of legitimate interest pursued by the controller or by a third party. Uh, similarly, under Article 49.1, international transfer of data is permitted in various circumstances, including where the transfer is necessary for important reasons of public interest or necessary for the purposes of compelling legitimate interest pursued by the controller. That is a lot of legalese. Anyway, yeah, so GDPR does not help, according to them, and apparently some exchanges have argued that it does, which is quite interesting. Under the section on... Uh, cooperating agencies, they cite and summarize FinCEN's guidance that I had previously highlighted actually in my first issue of the Bitcoin privacy newsletter regarding whether anonymizing software providers are required to register and comply with money transmitter laws, um, where it says in particular the guidance outlined the app the guidance outlined the application of FinCEN's regulations to persons who provide anonymizing services or who are engaged in activities involving anonymity-enhanced uh, convertible virtual currencies. According to FinCEN, anonymizing service providers and some AEC issuers are money transmitters, uh, whereas an individual or entity that merely provides anonymizing software is not. Uh, I have to scroll a bit. Yeah, so this is the fun part. So, um, yeah, they just, you know, were citing FinCEN and, you know, it's been some time and we did kind of talk about the FinCEN files, but I thought it'd be important to point out that, of course, the effectiveness of FinCEN's regulations and anti-money policies, uh, anti-money laundering policies generally have come under closer scrutiny over the last two months uh, because of the FinCEN files. Um, which, uh, if you weren't around to hear about them, they're based on suspicious activity reports or czars that were, uh, well, the FinCEN files was um, obtained by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which unfortunately, uh, as is their practice, they neither publish the raw or even unredacted source documents, but according to their analysis, U.S. agencies responsible for enforcing money laundering laws rarely prosecute mega banks that break the law. And the actions authorities do take barely uh, ripple the flood of plundered money that washes through the international financial system. And the reason I want to point that, this out is because it complements a study that was published earlier this year in a journal called Policy Design and Practice, which found that the anti-money laundering policy intervention has less than 0.1% impact on criminal finances, compliance costs exceed recovered criminal funds more than a hundred times over and banks, taxpayers, and ordinary citizens are penalized more than criminal enterprises. Of course, uh, the big players like Deutsche Bank would like you to believe otherwise um, because in response to the reports by the ICIJ and other media, they released a statement claiming that the billions of dollars that they've invested to fight financial crime leads to increased detection levels. Of course, uh, this month, this very month, on October 13th, they also happened to announce that the Economic Crimes Unit of the Frankfurt Public Prosecutor's Office has closed its criminal investigation, originally opened following allegations by a whistleblower uh, in 2018, uh, November 2018, and raids on their office. Um, apparently that investigation has been closed due to lack of sufficient suspicion in accordance with section 172, as in, uh, part two of section 170 of the German criminal, uh, the German code of criminal procedure. And the ICIJ noted that, um, they were fined $15.8 million, but this is equivalent to just 0.06% of their total net revenue generated in 2019. So, yeah, um that I guess show. Yeah, uh that that thing about not prosecuting mega banks, um yeah, keep keep still still happening, still happening. Yeah, it's just like oh my god. It's 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 really that that whole report or um announcement is, is just it's clear there is a single thing going on and that's just the money laundering meme and crypto can do that now so we got to port the bank stuff over there like that that is the entire single thread running through that entire thing like, it, it's the most transparent obvious like sham to just go it's gotta comply too 
Yep. Well, I but mean... it's not just crypto as in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. This has always been my one thing I really do not like about this administration. They are not technologically literate at all. I mean, I have yet to see a single administration that is, but anyway. Um, yeah, so another thing that's happening uh, lately is that, uh, well, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's director of strategy, Daniel Bryan, drew attention to some anti-encryption lobbying that's happening in Europe. Uh, apparently, these lobbyists are encouraging EU member states to agree to a new position on encryption in the final weeks of 2020. So we should see that coming up soon. But also, back to the US and Bill Barr. Um, on October 11th, he appeared as a signatory on the International Statement End-to-End uh, -end Encryption and Public Safety, also published by the DOJ, which seeks cooperation between technology companies and governments to, quote, gain access to data in a readable and usable format across the range of encrypted services available, including device encryption, custom encrypted applications, and encryption across integrated platforms. Um, there was also a, uh, back in June, there was kind of a similar thing. There was actually a bill called the Lawful Access to Encrypted Data Act, um, and similarly, Bill Barr published a statement when that bill was introduced saying, I'm confident that our world-class technology companies can engineer, um, can engineer secure products that protect user information and allow for lawful access. And uh, the statement, uh, the statement, the international uh, statement on end-to-end -end encryption and public safety was signed by the Secretary of State for the Home Department in the United Kingdom, also, Bill Barr, obviously, uh, Peter Dutton, the Australian Minister for Home Affairs, and the New Zealand Minister of Justice, Andrew Little, Bill Blair, the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness in Canada, and lastly, um, this was kind of a uh, funny thing uh, that I think I actually might have mentioned on the show before when it initially got published, but... Even though they have names and titles for all the other people, they list India and Japan with with like there there's no person it's just india and japan it's like okay but but who actually signed it did the entire country <laughs> sign it like who 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 why why do you, why does everyone else get named um but that might just be because uh the other countries are part of the five eyes and india and japan are not who knows um but yeah no names for there uh and one second while i scroll yeah, and so very predictably in this statement uh, that is against end-to-end -end encryption, they emphasize that particular imp implementations of encryption technology, however, pose significant challenges to public safety, including, a highly, including highly vulnerable members of our societies like sexually exploited children. They point to sexually exploited children a lot in this statement. Think and the kids. Yeah, I, I believe um, everyone should know, I think pedophiles are one of the uh, horsemen of the apocalypse that were mentioned in, uh, I can't remember if it was the Cypher the Cypherpunk Manifesto. Kill them. Yeah. Anyway, so while this is, uh, I mean, anyone who's been following this debate and the crypto wars, this is not the first time that the US government or any of these governments have have pulled a uh, think of the children excuse for infringing on civil liberties in coercing technology companies to proactively undermine or retro retroactively break um, encryption to the point where it's cliche, like I said. But yeah, I was like, I, I mean, again, this has been said so many times, but I was just once again pissed that this really stupid argument is being used again and i have a very personal reason for being offended by politicians who still think that this line of argument makes sense in the grams grand scheme of things and i realize there is uh one woman politician who signed this uh pretty patel i think from the uk but you know um uh, the point that i'm about to make still stands because women have as much potential to be sexual predators as men uh, the question I have every time I hear this argument is, don't you think that children want 
secure communication too like what (laughs) i i don't understand why these politicians think that by taking away security from everyone that automatically makes children and young people safer and not the opposite Mm -hmm. because Real, real quick interjection there is a website that um, just captures publicly available camera feeds and streams them. Ask yourself why the most popular one, like the most viewed stream, is a kid's playground somewhere in Switzerland, I think it was. Yeah, that's actually, that made me think of something else related. I think, I don't know if I brought it up, but there was, um, I, I watch in relation to privacy research, I look a lot at these like family YouTube channels. Um, and the debates around how they should include their children, whether they should include their children at all, how it infringes on their privacy and stuff like that. And there was one, um, I don't know, she might have just been a she might have just been a mommy blogger. I can't remember. But there was a, a one YouTuber who stopped um, including her children in her videos because she was going through Google Analytics and she realized, and because Google Analytics on YouTube um, will actually tell you, like, where are your, what websites are your videos being posted on? Where are they being watched? And she noticed that there was a lot of traffic coming from pedophile websites. And, like, she didn't, you know, she didn't have her children undressed or anything in her videos, but, like, they were watching them. And it's mm-hmm. like, yes, you are sh- literally, sh- you are streaming intimate details of your family life, including your children to strangers on the internet. You are going to get nasty people watching that. And you should realize, like, there are going to be people around the world who are going to be interested in watching your children if you give them that opportunity. Um, so, yeah, anyway, the question I have is why I- I'm I'm just, it stuns me every time why people think that children and young people aren't interested and don't need to have secure communications. Um, but, because, like, I'm just thinking, like, do children feel safer? I don't feel safer with the idea that a bunch of mostly older men either at a school, at a police station, or an FBI office, or the NSA. If the NSA watches children, they, there was that whole love intelligence uh, scandal, which is still ongoing, where they were spying on partners, but they probably spy on children too, you know. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Whatever agency you want to give these golden keys to, um, I don't see how people don't consider that that can actually make the situation worse. And there's actually a report that is relevant to this, which is um, something that was published by Defend Digital Me recently titled The State of Digital, uh, the State of Data 2020, Mapping a Child's Digital Footprint Across England, uh, the State Education System Landscape. And it was focusing on the uh, problems with ed, so-called ed tech, like educational tech, Um, and summarized that uh, basically they took a snapshot of the uses and abuses of children's data in school. And it starts off with a statement that um, should be shocking to people. Um, Well, it's not shocking to people who understand how shitty this is, but it should be shocking to people, which is they say that children have lost control of their digital footprint by their fifth birthday simply by going to school, like five-year-olds. Because apparently if you're a parent today, you're letting hundreds and possibly thousands of unknown people working at either these schools or agencies who are possibly monitoring the schools or working with the schools and also companies, various companies who are building this ed tech stuff uh, that children are often being forced to use or made so uncomfortable if they don't use it that they end up doing so. Um, they all have some degree of access to your children. And I don't mean like the kind of information that they're able to send your child in terms of educational material or advertising, which is a big part of it. Um, A lot of it comes with advertising, uh, really creepy stuff. Um, Also to parents, they basically advertise to the parents through some of these devices. Um, But also like, you don't think that they know a great deal about your kid, like what their interests are when they visit a counselor, a lot of the time their location, um, if it's a device that they are carrying around with them and where they live, like 
are you really comfortable with your child being conditioned to being watched and reachable by strangers from the age of five? Because, uh, I mean, luckily I wasn't subjected to that, but I wouldn't have been comfortable with that, and I wouldn't be comfortable with that for my children. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, to kind of tie back to the DOJ stuff, I mean, it's like these people are so incompetently disconnected from reality like they do not understand the request they are making and how that technology works and the social ramifications of that and like that is just a dangerous direction to go in that's why when this happened in the 90s the end result was no yeah speaking of uh the 90s um there was actually a profile of moxie the creative signal and i'm for various reasons not too big of a fan of him but i think the profile was actually good and it's relevant to this there was two parts in particular um he said in his view frequent law breaking points to systemic rot he often cites the legalization of same-sex marriage and in some states marijuana as evidence that people sometimes need to challenge laws or engage in nominally criminal activity for years before progress can be made before it was inconceivable he said after afterwards it was inconceivable that it was ever inconceivable privacy he says is a necessary condition for experimentation and for social change he compares the need for a secure digital space to the need for a private domestic one where for instance a child might safely experiment with gender identity or expression if i'm dissatisfied with this world and i think that i might be a problem is that you can only desire based on what you know uh you can certainly experience or you can have you have certain experiences in this world they produce certain desires those desires reproduce the world our reality today just keeps reproducing itself but if you can create different experiences that manifest different desires then it's possible that those will lead to the production of different worlds and then later on in the article um it says further on the principles um uh, the principles of cryptography have a childhood appeal, he told me, noting how children write in invisible ink with lemon juice, they speak in pig Latin, they come up with their own codes, they do Caesar ciphers, stuff like that. He began learning more about uh, advanced cryptography like the Diffie-Hellman key exchange and found it unintuitive and surprising... Wait. Found it unintuitive and surprisingly magical. Without uh, prearranging anything, two people can start talking to each other in a way that nobody can understand, even if they hear the entire conversation. You wouldn't think that that would be true. You can just start with nothing. So, like, I like the fact that he pointed out that, like, the the fact that children are interested in privacy, too, and they, with with no involvement of technology whatsoever, they are interested in engaging in private conversations and speak and, you know, not having everything, you know, spied on by their school, spied on by their parents or even their peers. Like they want to have it. They just don't know how to express it because so much of the world today is geared against that in a very top down manner. And so it's like becoming harder and harder for kids to do that. And I really hate that, like, <laughs> because I'm going to make sure that my children will always have this choice and i think the well to get back to how this is related to bitcoin i mean the i mean bitcoin doesn't quite use encryption but it has cryptography and that's a very very important aspect of how the system works and if people don't think that the general debate about uh you know encryption backdoors is going to come and affect bitcoin it will it will come uh, and especially given that, you know, Bitcoin can be used by anyone of any age, and that's one of the benefits. There's no one forcing you to, I mean, unless you go through an exchange, but don't do that. There's no one forcing you to identify yourself. Like, a, a child can send a Bitcoin transaction and no one stops them and no one says, oh, you have to be over the age of 18, blah, blah, blah. And so there's going to be a lot of kids using Bitcoin just because they can, and once they have it, they can do whatever they want with it. And that's a lot of power. And um, I mean, I would suspect that part of this has nothing to do whatsoever with protecting children. It has more to do with being able to control them uh, or at least be able to influence them in a way where they can be led in certain directions and not challenge the system. Mm -hmm. 
but it, it's just like you know th- this this fight is 10 times more important it was you know back in the 90s because it's not just nascent stuff slowly putting the webs out like the technology is an inescapable daily aspect of our lives right now like that this isn't like the the stakes of the outcome of pushes for crap like this are so much higher Mm -hmm. anyway what's shitbag brian up to i heard i heard he's being honest about stuff yeah, speaking of systems that are uh, des- being designed to be subverted. Um, so unless, again, like a lot of this stuff ends up being highlighted in my newsletter, but in last month's newsletter, I highlighted that the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been calling on Coinbase to start releasing transparency reports uh, regarding how many government requests for in- information it receives and how it deals with them. And uh, it is not clear uh, from Coinbase's uh, report whether that call from the EFF influenced them in any way because they literally gave no credit to them at all. But I suspect it probably did influence them because it came a month later. Uh, But anyway, many people in general are interested in such reports due to, you know, uh, as I have previously reported on the fact that they're communicating or collaborating with various agencies including the u.s secret service and the irs and the dea and so this this month uh coinbase's chief legal officer paul grewal who replaced uh, our favorite guy brian brooks earlier this year has finally published their first transparency report and they say Coinbase believes in protecting the financial privacy of our customers. Yeah, we, we <laughs> weasel words. Um, as part of our commitment to being the most trusted place to engage with cryptocurrency, we work every day to ensure customer information remains safe and secure from compromise, inappropriate use, or unnecessary disclosure. Uh, the report concerns only requests made in the first half of 2020. Um, so this is like a six month period worth of requests. So when you're I, I mean, I don't know if it'd be accurate to just double it for the year, but uh, that would require them to consistently put out reports, but let's just go with that. Um, it does not provide any details about the nature of the requests, which they calculate to be 1,914. Uh, one second, I have, to, uh, I have to take a break because I have to get something out of the oven. I'll be right back. Sorry for the break. Okay, I'm back. Where was I? Um, yes, so their report says that there have been 1,914 requests received during that six-month period, so the first half of 2020. Um, they do not identify the nature of them. They just say which was the requesting country or agency. And so about uh, 58% came from U.S. government agencies. This is what they break down. And then they further break it down further by uh, saying that a little over 30% or 340 of those requests were particularly from the FBI. And then about 8.8% or 98 requests came from IRS divisions. Um, There's like a general IRS category and then one specifically for the criminal investigation division. And then 9.3% or 104 requests come from the DEA. Those were the big ones. And then uh, I actually saw when they published this that Brian Armstrong commented that uh, the volume of requests is a, quote, tax on private companies, which translates into higher prices for consumers. Lots of second and third order consequences. Yes, there. It's it's about the money, apparently. <laughs> Um, But yeah, that is true. Um, Complying with uh, all of these requests is, uh, you know, that that is a burden. But, you know, you're you're trying to be a regulated exchange and follow all the rules and have your little revolving door. This is what you get. Um, And then I think this was a few days later on October 21st, the EFF and specifically they, I don't know what her official... Uh, role is, but she calls herself a legal activist. Uh, She was the one who initially published the call out for Coinbase to start publishing reports. Um, She says that Coinbase's report is an important but modest step towards the transparency reports that people should expect from their financial institutions 
and then she recommended further steps for improvement. I just can't stop laughing at how many stupid people there are that the that use Coinbase for something that would get the FBI's attention. Like, are you a moron? Yeah, well, uh, given that they don't tell us what the kinds of requests they're getting are, it's kind of hard to tell. Also, they're, you know, I don't, <laughs> don't see an NSL list or any, uh, you know, potentially more serious or sensitive ones or even like uh, as she says in the recommendation she says we have some ideas on how coinbase can improve its reports in the future first it would be helpful for consumers and advocates to know how many requests coinbase may have challenged or how many accounts were shut down as a result of these requests other companies routinely provide that level of detail um, for further reports from Coinbase and other financial institutions, EFF would like to see transparency reports that outline informal government requests that don't come from a subpoena, warrant, or other legal process, such as when law enforcement agencies have bullied companies to shut down accounts through coercion. We'd also like to see more information on how companies such as Coinbase handle government requests, which companies often make publicly available. It would also be useful for financial services such as Coinbase to start publishing how many suspicious activity reports they file with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network annually and about how many accounts. Yes, that would be relevant, wouldn't it, given the, uh, the FinCEN files? Hmm. Yeah, Coinbase still sucks. Brian's still a douchebag. Some things just never change. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, like, I, I mean, come on. Like, there is no way that they would have published this if the EFF hadn't, like, they've been pushing this since, like, 2018, and then they published a follow-up, like, a month before this. There is no way that they didn't do this report without looking at that EFF statement, like... Mm -hmm. and, the f and the fact that they just don't credit them or say thank you we agree that this is important is like they're such dicks like seriously just that uh gross like just just i don't know if you actually care about this shit and you y you should credit them because clearly they're the reason that you're you pretend to care about this at all yep all righty though Speaking of our favorite banking blockaders. So, yeah. I'm going to string together a bunch of different sources. And uh, so I apologize if some of them are not in the news desk. You can yell at me and I'll go find them. Um, but, yeah. PayPal is doing Bitcoin and some shit coins nobody cares about. And... Looking at everything I found all over the place, um, they are going to start literally just allowing you to buy and sell it. No withdrawals, no um, deposits, just buy it and sell it, um, kind of like Robinhood. And they're planning, um, I think, by sometime next year, um, rolling out Bitcoin acceptance uh, for merchants through PayPal. So they're, they're probably going to do a very slow roll um, deployment of anything beyond buying and selling. And they're, they're, they're going to try to beat the Bitcoin PayPal, their PayPal. Um, but there are also um, some claims circulating that they are in talks to buy um some companies in this space, um, one of which is specifically alleged to be BitGo, um, who is one of the biggest custodians in this ecosystem. And um, yeah, I think we're finally in the phase where something I've been barking is going to happen for years um, is starting to happen. Um, you have two strategies as an exchange or a financial company in this space. Um, you either button down the hatches and figure out how to outcompete the banks and legacy companies, or um, you better be trying to sell your shit to them when they start getting into the space. Um, Cause there are just, there is a whole different scale of world out there in terms of how many customers you have and have to deal with. And uh, yeah, 
um, if PayPal winds up buying BitGo, um, that's going to just be PayPal um, becoming a core major custodial player in this entire ecosystem, just buying BitGo. And if that happens, I'm willing to bet that it's not going to be the last time we see that in the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Mike Belshi is still running that thing. So uh, it's a match made in heaven, if I say so myself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, step aside from the celebration of Price Moon now, right? Um, and just think about that. Um, snap. A check is signed and a company changes hands. What are the consequences to this ecosystem? I mean, I am more interested in the fact that, like, seriously, I don't... If you're if you're just going to buy Bitcoin and just hold it on PayPal and you can't do anything with it until this so-called merchant thing is enabled, like, what are you doing? Like, I unless you seriously just want to buy Bitcoin so you can sell it later, there's like literally no point to this. And, you know, can't you can't guarantee that you're going to be able to sell it later uh, because PayPal has it. Um, and if they decide no, then it's not going to happen. Um, also, as I said at the start, PayPal is one of the banking blockaders. They literally shut down WikiLeaks account in response to Cablegate back in 2010. Guess what WikiLeaks did in response? They started accepting Bitcoin to escape PayPal and the other banking blockaders from yep. cutting off their money. Like, you you seriously think that that... that you know, if that happened 10 years ago and it's not going to happen again, just be prepared. Like, put your Bitcoin on PayPal and see how well that goes if you do anything on the scale of influence that, you know, anyone interesting has ever done. And they usually get kicked off of PayPal. Yep. So it's like, ah, man. Yep. Number might go up, but gonna be a lot of bad fallout from that i also have to point out that i find it funny because there was a moment there was some stupid libertarian conference back in like 2017 that i don't know who wrote it but the bio for peter Thiel was that he created paypal a non-state currency I was so confused i was like <laughs> what i was like i i literally i tweeted at the paypal um, support account. And I was like, are you a non-state currency? Because, <laughs> because I was like, no, you're, this is a, this is a complete lie. What are you talking about? PayPal is not a non-state currency. So it's funny now that they're actually the, they're accepting the first, uh, non-state currency, but that does not make PayPal a non-state currency. And it's not very non-state when, you know, you can't even get off of PayPal. Mm hmm. Righty. So lightning had an oopsie while we were on vacation. Hashtag reckless. Yeah. Um, so this one um, was just an LND issue. Um, but it was not something covered in the uh, actual lightning spec. It's just something that they didn't implement that also wasn't in the spec. Um, but when, when you have a digital signature, um, the S value used to do that um, has a positive and a negative um, equivalent that will both equal a valid signature for a specific key. And a while ago, um, it was made mempool policy um, to only accept the low S value in the signature. And um, so any high S value transaction, a node will not propagate it through the network in the mempool. And an attacker, a malicious party, um, could have signed with a high S value for a channel state. And then um, the HTLCs for that. And pretty much um, when you went to go respond to him later, malicious, or like closing to try to, to steal from you with an old state, um, your transaction would just get rejected from the mempool. 
and could let the HTLC timeout and the refund be spent. Um, and if you didn't know what was going on there um, to tweak the, the signature, like you, you just wouldn't get into the mempool, it would expire and they could take a, a refund for that, that they should not have been able to claim. And it was because they're during that, um, that pathway in the code base, there just wasn't a check, um, before broadcasting to see what the S value was. And there wasn't in the spec that consideration for you have to think about mempool policy and not just consensus rules. And so pretty much, um, there's no indication this was ever exploited. Um, and it's been patched now in the latest release, but, um, like they're, they're pretty much building out, um, the spec now to account for, um, mempool policy correctness as well as cause or consensus stuff, just because obviously, um, second layer protocols like this, um, you have to actually get your transaction into the mempool to get into a block. Um, so ultimately just a, a goof in one implementation that was never exploited. And I think it's a huge net win in now that any second layer protocol like this, like, you, you know, then they know now this has to go into the spec explicitly so that implementers do that correctly and you don't have oversights like that again. But it also does indicate like there are a lot of moving parts with protocols like that. So are you ready to get excited by the word bank? No. It, it bank, bank, banks, have banks have the opposite, have the opposite effect. effect. No, it's a good bank. Um, so Dennis Ryman um, f is working on a BTC pay extension um, to create um, third layer custodial accounts on top of a BTC pay server's lightning node. Um, and right now he's just got a GIF out of a very basic um, account access to send and receive um, in, a, in a browser login. Um, but in future versions, as he iterates forward with this, he wants to build out and standardize a API so that any um, anybody can just build a wallet that would hook into and work on top of this BTC pay extension. And um, yeah, this is fucking awesome as shit. I have ranted about things like this for the longest time. Like if, if we don't have the ability to scale second layers natively to people, whether it's pure scalability, affordability, like they can't handle it, whatever the hell it is, like Currently, your option is that, well, they're going to go wind up at PayPal or, or Coinbase or blah, blah, blah. But an extension like this for BTC Pay, which is stupid simple to set up, stupid simple to run, like they have done an amazing job, like packaging all of that for payment processing merchants. And they've even built out some um, on-chain wallet stuff. Um, and it's, it's just... Like if, if you can navigate the web um, with a little bit of proficiency, you should be able to handle running BTC pay. So if we do run into a situation down the line where any of those issues pop up as friction um, to sovereign second layers like this, well, hey, you can spin this up and you can bank your friends and family. You can handle their shit rather than throwing them into the, the depths of the, the ocean and getting eaten by sharks like Coinbase and PayPal. And despite the fact that they're not directly interacting with Lightning, um, like I, that is such a universe of improvement between like, oh, you can't handle this, go use PayPal. Um, to like, oh, I can just spin this up and you make an account here. Now you can use Bitcoin. And it, it's just fucking awesome as shit seeing like BTC pay moving in this direction too now. Like it, like they have gone so far beyond um, in terms of laying the foundation for stuff. Um, 
just merchant processing. And I am fucking psyched as shit to see this one. Like, I cannot wait to get this and play with it. Boop. Get excited about banks. No. It's a good bank. There are no good banks. Yeah, there is. The one where you personally know the guy who's running it, so you can punch him in the face if he takes your money. If, uh, if that's your definition of good, okay. I think it's amazing. But yeah, I think I think this is going to be um, th- this is going to grow into a big niche, I think, and we're going to wind up seeing a whole class of wallets that are just to hook on to this backend API and use this plugin. And uh, yeah, get excite, get excite, good bank. Alrighty then, I guess next More one lightning. is just a quick mention, but um. Apparently, Blockstream has been building up a uh, giant database of all the gossip messages um, through the history of the Lightning Network and apparently have been sharing this around um, with different academics for research, but they just dumped the uh, whole data set publicly. And so, um, you know, you, you can pretty much use this whole gossip history to recreate a, a model of the state of the lightning network at any given time that this uh data set was compiled for so uh anybody out there who wants to tinker around and play with that and see what kind of patterns have been emerging um fly but i would argue that this is kind of lightning news others would disagree with me um Commerce Block has dropped a command line only um, testnet version of their uh, Mercury state chain protocol um, with basic swapping functionality uh, built into it. So uh, anybody who has been hankering to play around with state chain stuff, um, all command line, but you can find a faucet. Um, I'm not sure if they have it set up or it's just a well-known faucet for some uh, testnet Bitcoin and go and download that. Um, it's just the very basic uh, setup right now. Um, you can open the state chain, um, transfer it, and then join a mix pool. But uh, yeah, this is uh, if you're comfortable with command line, you should uh, join me in playing with this because i would really like to see this um move very quickly into something production on mainnet because give me more layers all right to dan i'm gonna have to go get a beer so i can pour one out for this next story arrow oh apparently you missed my whole talking thing uh yeah so i don't know why you would pour one out because I mean we all knew this was coming. It's not that surprising or sad. Like an um, extra stab in the heart. It's like it's a dirt. It's you already you already killed it. You fatally stabbed it. Why'd you gotta stab it again? Well, there's still time to get out of the sinking ship. Um, but anyway, on October 21st, uh, BitMEX posted that they will be, quote, introducing changes to accelerate the rollout of our user verification program for individual and BitMEX corporate customers. Users must now be fully verified by the 5th of... S- okay. <laughs> Seriously, of all the dates you could have chosen, you chose the 5th of November? Losers. Seriously, 5th of November is like the worst day to do a KYC day. Suck it. So horrible. Their See, marketing third department. Stab. See? <laughs> that, I mean, that for me, that's the only stab. It's like, seriously, how dare you make 5th of November a KYC day? Um, anyway, 5th of November 2020, uh, to continue trading on the platform... Uh, unless you're fully verified. After this time, unverified users will not be able to open new positions, and from December 4th, uh, you will not be able to withdraw funds from your BitMEX account without completing verification. So, mm. but we knew that was coming. It's like, not a surprise, but seriously, November 5th, you people are so terrible. It's like, wrong day. People deserve the right to gamble like degenerates if they so choose, you fuckers. 
remember, remember the 5th of November. Uh, I know of no reason why this should be KYC season. I don't know. Just. <laughs> yeah. Bitmax will be an era. They will speak of the era of Bitmax. Of before Bitmax died. Anyway, uh, related to this, um, that might have actually contributed to this decision, but uh, back on October 5th, um, the block reported that uh, Chainalysis uh, went around contacting their clients, including government agencies, banks, and exchanges, to advise them they will consider BitMix a high-risk exchange from October 13th onward. Those using the company's transaction monitoring tool, which it called KYT, will now see both future and historical transfers from BitMEX trigger alerts in their system. It says any transfers from October 1st and later should be considered high risk. Compliance teams should also look back at older transactions, but given this change uh, may trigger alerts on thousands of older transfers, it is reasonable to do so incrementally. Um... So this is apparently a quote from the email that they sent to their clients. And then the block says a spokesperson for chain analysis said that its customers can set their own risk tolerance, but that as a general rule to protect them from reputational risk and other associated risks, we consider an entity to be high risk if criminal charges have been brought against the entity or its owners, operators, leadership. So that might have uh, contributed to this decision. Hey, degenerate gamblers who shouldn't have been degenerate gambling places, maybe consider that and don't get in trouble. Oopsies. You have until November 5th to jump off the sinking ship. That almost rhymes. And don't get your coins tagged or frozen somewhere directly sending a now high-risk thing um, immediately elsewhere. Just saying. Alrighty, what is this last one? There's a theme here. Yeah, so this will also be a relatively short one, which is that the FCA, I can't even remember, or wait, FSA? Wait, what? FCA. FCA. Um, yeah, I wrote it wrong. Um, I don't even remember what it stands for, but something, financial regulatory something in the UK, uh, as of October 6th, has published final rules banning the sale of derivatives, exchange trade notes, uh, ETNs, and that reference certain types of crypto assets to retail cost to customers. The FCA considers these products to be ill-suited for retail consumers due to the harm they pose. These products cannot be reliably valued by retail customers or retail consumers because of the, and then they list off a bunch of things like the inherent nature of the underlying assets, which means they have no reliable basis for valuation, the prevalence of market abuse and financial crime in the secondary market, ergo cyber theft. <laughs> Um, extreme volatility in crypto asset price movements that are uh, inadequate or inadequate under understanding of crypto assets by retail consumers and lack of legitimate investment need uh, for retail consumers to invest in these products. Um, and they note that this ban will come into effect on January 6, 2021. Um, and given that I don't engage in any services whatsoever that use derivatives of crypto assets um i was kind of looking around to see who would be affected by this and i haven't really figured that out yet but one um one that i thought of immediately was actually revolut because um i remembered there was a recent episode of tales from the crypt where i can't remember the context but i remember them mentioning that revolut was they thought that revolut was a um online banking service that used derivatives of cryptocurrencies instead of having the crypto assets themselves and actually revolut published a statement um, in response to this ban, saying the good news is that you don't have to worry because the ban doesn't affect Revolut's current cryptocurrency offering. This is because the ban only applies to derivatives and exchange-traded notes. We don't provide these products. Instead, we buy and hold crypto on our customers' behalf. So basically, they're, I guess, they're like the, the British PayPal in terms of the model, where they, you know, you buy it, but you don't actually have it. And, but at least it's not derivative, I guess. Not that it makes much of a difference. 
that. <laughs> Always try to take our right away to gamble like degenerates unless it's a state taxed lottery. Fucking bullshit. Although I think somebody in the chat is entirely correct. Um, oh, then they have to bid up real Bitcoin. Hmm. Maybe the government shouldn't let people gamble like degenerates. Maybe that is better for everyone involved. Alrighty, though. Ah. Guess that's a wrap for the day. We got any final thoughts going on? Yes, I do. It's a sad thought, so maybe you want to go first. Well, apparently Kanye West's on Joe Rogan talking about, like, you know, Bitcoin being the only way to have freedom in the digital age. So, like, that's pretty fucking awesome. Sure. I think I'm going to have to immediately go watch that. Well, my final thought is uh, that, unfortunately, um, actually, one second, I need to get something first. Yeah, so my final thought is that many of you may have seen about uh, oh, six days ago now that uh, the owner of Room 77 announced that the bar would be closing. Uh, in a statement on Reddit, he said, we are people from a, I mean, this is a great outro statement as sad as it is. Uh, we are people from a solar system not yet discovered by humanity and have been waiting uh, well, I have been watching your species for the last 30,000 years. We have reason to believe that Homo sapiens will go the same way as Erectus, Neanderthalus, and Denisovians. However, when we discovered that the Nakamoto guy invented Bitcoin, we realized that you do have a future. Once a civilization has developed a planetary hard money system, it usually does not take long until its members become peaceful and start putting their resources into developing longevity and space travel instead of governments and weapons. The first 10 years of such a money are crucial, as there are always forces who want to hold back development and keep you in chains. We therefore stopped by, occupied that little joint in Berlin-Kreuzberg, and started promoting and explaining the importance of this step to the unaware pub public and offering a place where development of the technology is being driven forward. And we had a great time doing so and have a, um, having a lot of fun and making many friends. It is clear by now that nobody will stop Bitcoin anymore. Sound money on a global scale will soon make it unfeasible to wage wars, and it will create economic equality amongst mankind. We estimate that it will take you less than another century to rise and join the intergalactic community. So see you all, see all you sweet people out there soon. Thanks again for all the fish and generous tips. Um, so yes, that is a quite a uh, funny goodbye note from Jorg. Um, but yes, room 77 is, well, it has been closed since shortly before the lockdown started in Berlin. So no one has been there for a while, but yeah, uh, I am so sad about this because Room 77 is awesome, although um, I have to say, little birds have been telling me that this uh, may not be permanent, so uh, prepare for the spaceship to return someday. Well, I hope. I mean, like, I'm glad I got to fucking go there uh, the times I did, like, I that was just shitty thinking like, oh, I can't get back out there sometime and pop in for a visit. Yep. It has, uh, if anyone doesn't know, Room 77 was one of the first uh, businesses, uh, brick and mortar businesses to accept Bitcoin. It was also the location of the first lightning transaction, or at least the first lightning uh, merchant transaction. So a lot of memories and significant stuff happened there and uh if you haven't been there there's like posters of uh quotes from julian assange and aaron schwartz and edward snowden and russell bricked on the wall um and if you ever went there prior to i don't know when they stopped doing it but there uh, there was a number of times where i believe they usually played um Oh, I just forgot his name, the comedian in the bathroom. Um, yeah, they played, uh, er, what's his name? Shinobi, do you know? Do you no, know who I'm talking about? that was not a thing while, while I was there. One second, I need to look it up. I feel so stupid because literally it was mentioned a few weeks ago and I've already forgotten his name. One second. 
I will say though, I bet Yurig's life is going to be a lot less stressful um, dealing with Bitcoiners who won't stay at the same table. Yeah. Okay. So Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks used to play in the bathroom, among other things. Um, yeah, it was quite funny. Also, uh, I believe like, yeah, there was. It was a good place. Um, but I don't. I feel like people are not going to let it close. So, yeah. Boop. Well, that would be fucking awesome because, yeah, I have been looking forward to uh, jetting back out that way and popping in there again sometime in the future. I have to talk shit at uh, at Jurg about uh, Andreas Schildbach not knowing the story behind why the Android wallet was originally made. To blockchain infinity and beyond, as they say. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess uh, that wraps her up. We're back for another season, punks. Catch you later. Bye. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> <laughs>